let me begin the session by welcoming you all and uh, <clears throat> to this particular session where we are discussing a paper by Monte Carlo Alia and uh, Otkarsh Patel of the Center for Science, Environment and Service. We, we are all aware the planet is currently confronting a major challenge in the form of climate change. It has now become an absolute necessity for every country to carry out mitigation measures to overcome the challenges posed by climate change. Uh, this paper by uh, Dr. Montesing Aluwali and Utkesh Patel is a very comprehensive paper that discusses India's strategy to mitigate climate change by reducing emissions in sectors that account for almost all of the country's carbon dioxide emissions. It discusses long-term and short-term strategies, problems, and their viable solutions to implement those strategies. To mitigate climate change, it is important to phase out coal and fossil fuel-based energy and invest more and more in renewables. This may pose various challenges if transitional policies are not holistic and just. But India has still not committed to coal. It has only agreed to phase down the coal consumption in view of level of economic development. Other strategies to mitigate climate change, like investing in renewables, green hydrogen, and technological innovations in green technologies, are being accelerated. With the introduction of carbon border adjustment mechanism by the European Union, which is likely to come into effect from 2026. India should also develop an explicit carbon tax regime that will help limit carbon emissions and the revenue generated could be used for financing green projects as well as make our exports competitive. Coal mining and other fossil fuel sectors engage a huge amount of labor force, uh, which will become unemployed if they are not absorbed by other sectors. Although the jobs in the rural sectors are increasing, they require specific skill sets. For this, India can prepare a plan for proper training to workers for a smooth transition. This will ensure that the interests of poor and vulnerable, vulnerable people are secured while moving towards a renewable energy-based economy. Technology is playing an important role in mitigating climate change. Technological developments have made solar energy cheap and accessible. Carbon capture and storage technologies will help remove excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere accelerating the mitigation process. Mitigating climate change also requires behavioral changes in the people. SDG 12 speaks about sustainable consumption and production, which can lead to environmental benefits and sustainability. There is a need to shift people's behavior and consumption patterns to reduce the use of more carbon emitting resources and shift towards a clean energy and sustainable lifestyle. About life. Uh, India, with the target to achieve net zero by 2017, needs to accelerate its processes, which will require massive investments. As mentioned in the paper, India will require an additional $200 billion approximately to achieve its commitments. Climate finance was in focus at COP26, and developing countries like India are highly dissatisfied with the failure of developed countries that promise to give $100 billion a year for adaptation and mitigation measures. So at this point, multilateral development institutions will need to play an impactive role in financing climate efforts by developing countries. Before concluding, let me recall the work around the above issue being done at cuts. We are working towards uh, electro electric vehicle transition in passenger mobility and in road freight. We are documenting sustainable production and consumption practices at the grassroots level. We are also promoting the EcoMark scheme, uh, which aims to reduce environmental impact of products. We have implemented uh, big projects in East Africa to treat climate change and food security. Now, this is another very important thing because it impacts food security. Now, with the introduction of the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, measures uh, by European Union, now, trade and environmental linkages have become one of the future agenda of W. But she's also working on such issues. With that, uh, uh, let me welcome you all once again and to request uh, Motek uh, to please present his paper. 
Thank you very much, uh, Pradeep. Thank you for inviting me to make a presentation. I think as you pointed out in your remarks, uh, Guts is doing many of the things that are relevant. And uh, I will take, uh, I, I will use a, a slide presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Am I? Okay. Yeah. So I will use a few slides, not the entire presentation because it's a pretty dense sort of subject. And I mean, those who are, are interested in learning more, let me do a bit of advertisement and hold up uh, the working paper of CSEP, which sets, up, uh, sets out all of this. So this is available on the website. So I, if I don't cover everything in detail, uh, I have the, uh, the residual confidence that you know, I can always say, well, please look up my paper and you'll get a lot more information. When I say my paper, I mean by Utkarsh and me. I think Utkarsh is also on the call. And I believe if there are some technical questions which he is better suited to answer, maybe he'll do that. So let's begin straight away with, a, with what I would call a background slide. So could you put on the first slide, please? You know, this slide, uh, traces what's been happening to carbon concentration and to temperature over a very long period, beginning in 1950 in this particular case, I think. Yep. And you can see that- 1850. 1850. Uh, and you can see that uh, the blue line is really the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere as parts per million. And the red line is, uh, temperatures above pre-industrial level, okay? Now, obviously, year-to-year -year variations in temperature do take place for other reasons. But as you can see, that from about 19, uh, I can't quite see this, from 1970 onwards, the carbon concentration seems to be building up uh, quite a bit, actually even before. Uh, but as a result, temperatures are rising. And then you have the, uh, the projected period. Now, you know, this problem was recognized uh, at the time of the Paris Agreement in 2015, when for the first time, developing countries undertook uh, to do some mitigation. You know, before that, the developing countries tended to argue that, look, they weren't responsible for the carbon concentration, so it should really be done by the solutions should be sought by developed countries from developed countries uh, and they would have they they really didn't have a big obligation to reduce but in in paris they agreed to reduce the emissions intensity of gdp that means emissions divided by gdp and you know emissions intensity reduction doesn't mean that emissions are reduced because gdp is rising so that would be actually consistent with emissions rising also. Everybody was very pleased at 2000, in 2015 that for the first time, developing countries have agreed to, to reduce the emissions intensity of GDP. And you know, the, the, the two dashed lines that you see, uh, they indicate what would have happened basically on the basis of the Paris uh, outcomes. And, it turns out that if everybody did what was being said only in Paris, then the temperature increase would go to about 2.8 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial level. And you know, this might look small, but the scientific opinion brought out very clearly by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was that anything above 1.5 degrees would have very, very negative effects. And countries like India would be among the countries most adversely affected. So quite clearly, uh, the prospects after Paris were not good enough. And in Glasgow, people thought about this further. And there was an agreement internationally. For the first time, again, developing countries agreed to actually reduce the absolute level of emissions. So that's going beyond reducing emissions intensity and to bring them down to zero at some point in the future. I mean, different countries chose different endpoints. Uh, China, uh, Indonesia chose 2060, we chose 2050. 
Most countries, sorry, we chose 2070. Most countries chose 2050. Some developed countries in Europe chose 2045. Now, what this graph tells you is that the, the lower, the dotted line tells you what has to happen to carbon emissions if you want the temperature increase to go down to something like, uh, you know, 2.4 degrees uh, cent, uh, uh, Celsius above uh, the, sorry, 1.4 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, okay? And 1.4 is obviously better than 1.5, but, but you can see the tremendous change, the curve which we were on has to bend, be bend downward very, very sharply. And uh, what has happened in Glasgow is that the all the countries have ad uh, agreed to some reduction in emissions, but they are really somewhere in between. So the Glasgow uh, pledges, although a bit changed from the past, do not get us to where we have to be if we want to achieve uh, the objective of staying below a 1.5 degree increase above pre-industrial levels. So Glasgow was a big change, but Glasgow is not enough. This is the global picture that we need to keep in mind. And one of the issues that has come up is how are we going to get back to what we want to be, which is below 1.5 degrees C. Uh, the international community has said, we're gonna discuss this in COP27. That's a very open issue because the problem will be, everybody, everybody will be asked to tighten, but who's going to tighten more is going to be the operational point. And there's no decision on this, but it's something we need to keep very much in mind. Now, you know, let's turn to the next slide. Um, I think, uh, can you put on the second slide, please? You know, this slide points out a very important thing in the whole strategy. We are now talking about India. I mean, the earlier slide was about the world as a whole. We recognize the world has to do more. We will probably have to do more also. So let's look at the, what this paper does is it looks at what is needed in order to reduce emissions. And I've got six points here, which I think are critical. First, you increase energy efficiency by promoting the use of energy efficient appliances and also energy efficient systems. See, when I say appliances, I mean, for example, if you're using an air conditioner, uh, how can you make it more energy efficient? And if you're talking about systems, we're thinking of moving from, let us say, uh, freight transport by road to freight transport by rail, or moving passengers from private motor cars to public transport. That's a system change. Second thing is you need to engage in electrification. This means switching from the direct use of fossil fuel. For example, in transport, people use diesel and petrol. Don't use diesel and petrol, but switch to electricity. That's a big transformation that has to be done. It has to be accompanied by shifting electricity generation from coal and gas-based to renewables. It's important to emphasize that electrification by itself will not reduce emissions if the electricity is produced by coal. But the combination of electrifying as much as possible and shifting electricity generation from coal and gas based to renewables, the two together make a very big difference in the amount of emissions that turn up. Then you've got difficult areas like hard to abate areas where it's not easy to get rid of fossil fuels. I mean, you can, you can bring in green hydrogen uh, in some of these areas like for steel, cement, uh, refining, etc. Uh, and that's one, uh, that's one area where technology is not yet fully developed. You can expand afforestation to increase the natural ability of the earth system to absorb CO2. And you can develop carbon capture, utilization and storage, where basically you, you, gra you grab the carbon capture, you grab the COD, CO2 that has been produced and somehow neutralize it by converting it into some other uh, substance. Okay, let's now move to the, to the last, the third slide. I see here, uh, I think it's very important in all these steps that decarbonizing the power sector is absolutely critical. 
And this is really for two reasons. First of all, power in any case accounts for about 50% of the emissions so far. But if you're going to also electrify, then many things which currently do not use electricity are going to use electricity. So the demand for electricity is going to expand and it's extremely important that this electricity is produced through non-polluting means. Those means that, I mean, one can do some balancing and so on. One of the big problems is that uh, RE power is intermittent and it needs balancing. The balancing can be done on the supply side, but also on the demand side. And the difficulty is that whichever way you do it, I mean, certainly on the supply side, you can do some balancing, for example, by bringing in battery storage, uh, but that costs money. So it affects the financial competitiveness of RE. I mean, the present situation is that uh, RE is actually cheaper than solar. If you're just looking at the electricity produced and accepting the unbalanced nature of the supply and demand position. But since when you manage the grid, you have to produce the electricity in a manner that is balanced, then you have to add the cost of balancing. If it's, if it's batteries, it means add the cost of battery storage. And when you do that, RE is not at the moment competitive. It may become competitive over time. This is not a big problem at the moment because you know RE is still a very small part of our total electricity. I think it's less than 11%. Uh, and therefore, if RE goes down at a certain period, you can ramp up the rest of the system. But you know, if we actually bring about, achieve the objectives that we have set for ourselves, then the, the share of RE in total electricity will increase very substantially. I think it'll be about 30% uh, perhaps by 2030, 50% by 2050, and even 70% by 2070. Now if 70% of the total electricity is RE based, and therefore inherently intermittent, we have to bring in systems of balancing both on the demand side and on the supply side. Another important point, which is a structural change. If we are going to do this, then we have to recognize that coal-based power has to be phased out. Now, this is politically not easy to accept because it means loss of employment in coal mining and related activities which are concentrated in certain sectors. But I think there is no point in, we have the advantage that the adjustment will take place over a period of time. But I think we should recognize that the adjustment is almost there and we cannot actually ignore it too much. So we better start planning for it now, which is what Pradeep mentioned in his introductory remark. You know, also important that electricity pricing uh, needs to be rationalized. I mean, one of the big problems we have at the moment is that our distribution companies are financially extremely weak and they're weak and, and efforts have been made to correct it by several governments and all of them have more or less uh, had very limited success. If these distribution companies are as weak as they are and if the investments needed in electricity are going to come from the private sector, which they have to, because the public sector just doesn't have the resources, then quite frankly, uh, we will not be able to encourage private investment to sell power to distribution companies that are financially weak. So we won't achieve the objective that we are hoping to get. Hence, to my mind, uh, 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 reforming the distribution companies to improve their financial systems is a very, very high priority. And linked to that also is rationalizing electricity pricing, both wholesale and retail. We need a completely modern uh, uh, system of electricity marketing, which allows for price discovery, trading, et cetera, which at the moment we don't really have. And I think a related issue <coughs> is the case for introducing carbon taxation. You know, at the moment, uh, because coal doesn't bear the price which reflects the cost of external, the external costs that it imposes, coal-based electricity looks cheap. But if we were to introduce a carbon tax, which would basically tax each fuel, 
according to the according to the um, pollution that it generates, then there would be a fairly high tax on coal, which would get reflected in uh, the electricity uh, derived from coal, and that would actually make uh, renewable electricity a lot cheaper. So if you're if you're trying to bring about this change, it makes a lot of sense to introduce carbon taxation, especially because we need the resources. I mean, if we don't introduce carbon taxation, we find some other way of uh, of generating the resources we need to undertake both the mitigation as well as the adaptation that we have to do for uh, uh, coping with climate change. Now. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, uh, we have similar problems of decarbonizing in, in industry. You can take this slide off. Uh, decarbonizing industry, uh, there are certain hard to abate areas where uh, coal is used uh, not just to generate heat. I mean, where heat is the only thing, maybe electric arc furnaces can do the trick, although they're more expensive. But coal is used as an essential part of the chemistry. Uh, and in those cases, green hydrogen is seen to be the solution. Again, it's high cost, but also people think that this cost will go down. I mean, Reliance Industries chairman has said that he's aiming to expand investment in green energy and bring the cost of green energy down from $6 a kg to $1 a kg. Now, if that were to happen, certainly the economics would change. You know, this is one of the points about this whole transition that a lot is going to depend on how technology moves ahead. I mean, even today, 10 years ago, solar power was far more expensive than it is now. Technology has made it possible to produce it cheaply. So this whole argument that we can move out of coal into renewables is based on the assumption that technology has made this possible. And of course, this technology uh, can continue. Many of the things in climate change at the moment look expensive, but if you're talking about a 30 year or 40 year period, then it's quite possible that they will become feasible later on. I think one of the areas where we really need to think seriously about decarbonizing is transport. Now, clearly the railways is one area which is a low hanging fruit. I mean, the railways will be fully, the, the, the tracks will be fully electrified in a couple of years. Uh, that doesn't mean that the railways will be also electrified because uh, traction will still involve diesel locomotives. So the question is how much, how can they be phased out? I think uh, uh, the railways have said that they are going to go to net zero by 2030. Uh, I don't know what is uh, implied there about the production plan for diesel locomotives, because at the moment we have diesel motor, loco locomotives which will continue to be produced for the next seven or eight years. Uh, so diesel locomotives can be converted to electric locomotives. That, that's a research task. I think they're working on it. But you know, this gives you an idea <clears throat> that there are a lot of uncertain things. Then you have uh, electric vehicles. Now that has started dominantly in the two and three wheelers, but also a little bit in the four wheelers. I think in these areas, uh, the rest of the world is also moving. If you ask whether we are doing something, we're certainly doing something. The question is how rapidly will electrification take place and what can government do about it? Now, to my mind, the government can do a lot. Uh, in certain areas, like for example, uh, give a signal that, you know, central government, public sector, state sector, state government, etc. future vehicles bought will only be EVs. I mean, that would be, uh, going uh, signaling to the world how you want to go. I think a major step in moving towards public transport, whether it is metros or electric buses. I mean, with public transport, it's possible to do it now with electric buses. That costs money. So the local governments that actually buy the buses have to be, as it were, assisted to do that. But a big thrust in that area would make a difference. And there are other things which, you know, discourage private transport. I mean, for example, raise parking charges, put in congestion charges, things that are not very popular, at least in the car owning and car driving population. 
but most people feel that it's a system change. And in our paper, we, we show how there's a very large number of things that need to be done, and they have to be done at different levels of government. Similarly, if you look at one of the big changes that India will face, it's really urbanization. You know, the urban population will increase from 31% in the last census very quickly to 50%. And this will be accompanied by both rising incomes and therefore rising demand for electrical appliances, etc. cetera. Uh, within cities, there's a huge need to bring in uh, more electrically efficient appliances. There's a huge need to move towards spatial planning that will minimize the need for car travel uh, and so on. I mean, the bottom line in all this is that uh, if you made a list of what needs to be done, there are many, many things that need to be done. Uh, you cannot exactly guarantee how effective any of these changes will be, but you can be pretty sure that you know, they will be significantly effective. And the important thing at the moment is to build the political consensus to actually start on these things. Many of these things are actually politically sensitive. I mean, for example, if you want to move to... Uh, Monte, would you like to uh, wind up? Wind up? Okay, I'll wind up. If you want to move to an energy efficient system, people will respond to energy prices. But unfortunately, large parts of our system, for political reasons, keeps the price of electricity very low. Now, are we willing to break that and put in rational energy pricing, rational electricity pricing, so that people have an incentive to buy electrically efficient uh, appliances? If you really want to improve the financial condition of the public uh, distribution systems, Maybe some of the states should consider privatizing at least a part of the system. So we made a list of a number of these things, many of which are politically sensitive. And I think we want to put that out on the agenda and say, look, this should be part of the general debate. I won't go on and on about most of the lots of other things to talk about. But the bottom line I want to say is that we cannot have a plan for 2070. I mean, you cannot make plans over such a long period. But because it's multi-sectoral and multi-government, we should have a 10-year plan of what are we going to do in each of these major sectors. In each of them, there are many things to be done, some by the central government, some by the state government, some by the private sector. That needs a lot of coordination across ministries, between center and states, with the private sector. We ought to have an agenda for 10 years. That won't solve the problem, but you know, if we do a good job in the first 10 years, we'll have gained a lot of experience and the next 10 years we can do better. So that's the bottom line. We need to move from aggregate slogans to sectorally detailed targets for 10 years. One obvious target, for example, is when are we going to start reducing uh, dependence on uh, coal-based power? In other words, not phasing it out completely, but indicate when it will peak and then start falling. Something like this really needs to be done. Anyway, I could go on and on, but I don't propose to do that. You've been very kind to give me so much time. So thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, Monte. Uh, thank you. There's a little excess in time, but uh, but it was wonderful as uh, as expected. Now, may I, uh, ideally, uh, you know, we segue into uh, uh, Suresh Prabhu's territory as a former power minister and former railways minister. Suresh Bhai, can I request you to please comment on these two points please, which uh, Monte uh, made, uh, on railways and electricity? Hello? Okay, actually I was... Oh, oh. Uh, thank you, uh, Pradeep Bhai. And uh, I just yeah. want to yeah. make only two comments. One is that uh, yeah. Yeah. when because I think this program is in relation to what India should be doing or what could be the India's response and how India is going to be affected. So these are the... You have some noise in your background. Can you please put it off? Suresh Bhai? Some... So it's... Uh, 
can you two, can you two, two can you ally, can you uh, speak on electricity and railways this is the two important aspects of what we are trying to do is one is uh, as we always talk about when we talk about 2070204050 to make it net zero the ultimate idea is to reduce the emission which is extremely important and therefore we always talk about the global context in which it has to happen and it will never happen global globally unless each country contribute so obviously we are focusing now on country strategy to control it reduce it and that will happen but that happening globally as well as in various countries will largely depend upon the kind of technological changes we'll see as we go along and one of them is obviously the carbon storage not storage of carbon but i'm talking about storage of energy itself and therefore that will depend upon the global technological innovation and i think we are almost on the cusp of it globally so once this happens somewhere we'll get it into that the second important part of that global change that is going to happen is about a hydrogen and i think that again will depend upon how do you break water into hydrogen and carbon and so how do you make that hydrogen that's very important if you are going to use the kind of energy that is required to break that it, and the same kind of energy or we are saying that we'll use renewable energy but we'll generate renewable energy and then we'll make it into the liquid uh, hydrogen and then we'll transport it how are going to happen so that's another important aspect of technology piece that must happen while we work on that the second important part from the india's perspective is while we should be part of the global uh, discourse in terms of reducing emissions and therefore mitigation is extremely important but very very critical part for india would be as i said technology will bring it down hopefully as we go along to bring the temperature below 1.5 hopefully and that might happen hopefully by this but while we make that that transition and that will always largely depend upon the energy transition which will depend upon the global changes again but second part will be the adaptation part which is so important and in this net zero debate i think we are missing out that particular piece and very prominently i think unless we focus on adaptation in a big way we'll have a big problem because when we talk about energy transition we obviously need resources and those resources if they are going to be diverted more into adaptation part of it then obviously there will not be anything left out of it and adaptation resources will be necessary in any case you cannot avoid them because that's the reality that will happen because climate change is really happening in a significant way so this is another part that we should keep in mind and my last point is and while we talk about all this we are now seeing some very disturbing trends like for example there obviously the reason we all know but now even europe is moving towards now they have started operating some of the coal fire plants in germany for example and they might even have more to do that depends upon how bitter the winter, winter would be what would be the situation of the gas that is coming from russia into europe and many other factors and therefore now we are seeing that while we are working on some technology and we are thinking that the baseline was so much so that we could be able to reduce the emission these are the new disturbing developments so i think uh, this is adding challenge to already stressed uh, situation on climate change globally so i have i have already was waiting for a long time to speak so i go because i had told deepak um, pradeep bhai said you can speak at 3 but i have to go for some other program so i would but thank once again for this opportunity and i hope we all work together to make it happen thank you very much Thank you, Suresh Bhai. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I hope uh, we we were hoping for some granular suggestions, but I'll leave it at that. And perhaps the plan which Montague suggested in order to build up a political consensus is something which you could take forward uh, in the in the polity of our country. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much once again. May I invite Dr. Vibha Desai? Vibhav Dhawan, sorry, uh, seven to eight minutes. We are running late, so maybe I'll uh, restrict my comments. And it was so uh, well illustrated by Montag uh, Aluwalia. 
what the country should be doing and what are the options, what is the situation and so on. Now, since I come from a research institute, my emphasis will be more on where are we in terms of research. It goes without saying climate change, which two decades before we were saying is a threat. Today we know it's a reality. And whatever is happening at the global level or the recent IPCC report, it has proved or it has shown that what we expected a decade before the consequences are going to be worse than that. Whether we talk of floods in Germany, New York, or the cloud bus, which perhaps has become a norm in our country, is all impact of climate change. The other harsh reality is that those of us who can take the risk are the polluters. They are not impacted that much as much as the poor communities of our country. It's also that climate change is going to have negative impact more on the countries which are already stressed. Whether it is in terms of food security, whether it is in terms of energy security and so on. But at the same time, I don't want to be perceived as that I'm only talking of the negative side. Now let's look into the positives. Yeah, Dr. Dhawan. Yeah. Dr. Dhawan. Dr. Dhawan. Yeah. Can I ask you a very specific question as I had sent to you? I mean, what you've spoken about is something which we are all very familiar with. Yeah. So what is the value addition you can bring to this discussion is very important. Absolutely. The question is, what will be the strategies? Yeah. And you're, so you're heading, Terry. What will be the strategies for a just yeah. transition from fossil fuels to renewable sources of power generation? Sure. So when we are talking of the strategies or the importance of just transition, First of all, when we talk of coal, perhaps that's, that's the only fossil fuel. Of course, we do have uh, oil wells somewhere here and there, but largely we have only the coal reserve. If we look at the use of coal by other countries, it is still happening. So let's not go percentage-wise in terms of the overall usage. Coal, is, coal usage is there. Of course, one is not saying we should continue with the coal. We are also worried about what kind of uh, gener job generation we'll be able to do. But we have adequate time and we will be able to generate green jobs. Now, coming to energy transition, again, one has to see what role can solar play, play what role can wind play. And most importantly, and that's what I was coming to, that in years to come, like India are demand still haven't peaked. We also have to build infrastructure and therefore we don't have to replace infrastructure. We have to create cleaner, greener infrastructure. I'll start right from the buildings and lay, of course, it's a new state uh, recently carved out. So over there, a lot of infrastructure development is required. So rather than depending on the conventional way of buildings, perhaps one should go for Press mud houses and so on. So the material which can be created locally. So infrastructure development should depend on that it is going to be there, like if it is along the coast, then what is going to be the environmental impact so, and how green you can go. So a sustainable building material. So that goes on the infrastructure side. As rightly mentioned, that we need to have appliances which are more energy efficient. It goes without saying because energy saved is energy created. All the industries, when they are going towards decarbonization, the very first step is energy audit, that they have to save every unit of energy that they can and go for renewable as much as possible. The other point is that Globally, let's not only talk of global finance, let's also talk of sharing of the technologies. As a country, we shouldn't reinvent the broken wheel. It is that those technology, first of all, it's not plug and play. You have to work on those technologies to make them suitable for our requirements. It's a country of small and medium enterprises. So how do we take the green technologies to them? It's not just restricted to Adani's and Ambani's, it's far beyond that. The third, and then it is that when you have to work on technologies, 
it is that we, the India, it should be taken as a partner to refine those technologies. And over there, I'll say the role that center of excellence can play because one is technology development. The second part is adopting that technology to suit our needs. And third part is how do we adopt those technologies? So do we have trained manpower? who will also, apart from teething problems, will also ensure that it is delivered in the most efficient way. And therefore, we need to create technical manpower in those disciplines. Thank you. So, yeah, so that's what I would like to say at this stage. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you again. Yeah. Can I turn to Pablo? Uh, Pablo, the elephant in the room is climate financing. Yes. Uh, uh, Pablo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can you put on your video? Yes, good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, is uh, the connection good? Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm calling from a remote call. We can't see I, you. We can only see your silhouette. Oh, I don't know. Uh, hmm, let me see what's going on. No, it doesn't I'm matter. Calling... Please carry on. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, calling from you... a... My question to you is, how can India finance its climate mitigation efforts? And what role should developed countries and international organizations like the bank play in financing India's climate actions? And particularly, if you remember the, uh, recall the points made by Montek in his presentation, if you could react to that, it would be very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, certainly. Okay, so uh, again, many thanks you for the You have about invitation. seven minutes. Yeah. Many thanks, uh, Pradeep, for the invitation and thanks for the previous speakers. This is a very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm calling from a remote location, so my apologies if the video is, is not good. So, um, responding to your questions. Of your, course, audio not... is, your audio is good. Okay, okay, that's perfect, yeah. So, responding to your questions, uh, well, mobilizing climate finance requ requires massive actions from, from multiple stakeholders. So, we have, of course, the public sector, we have governments, we have the private sector, which uh, will need to have a uh, increasingly important role. And of course, we have the development community and uh, multilateral de development banks. I think let's start a little bit from, from the public sector. Uh, some of the actions um, from the public sector and some were already mentioned here is to think a little bit at, the, at a, a more fair uh, playing field. It's very important to address these uh, climate and environmental externalities. Uh, it was mentioned, for example, uh, put a price on carbon, uh, there's also other, other options, you know, to, to better price water, uh, to, to better price uh, fertilizers for agriculture, for example, to, to think a little bit about um, repurposing subsidies. I think, I think we all agree that this is very important to, to mobilize resources to, to, to rural areas, but uh, probably thinking about repurposing subsidies for agriculture uh, is one way also, um, one important priority for the public sector and so on. Also, the public sector can think about uh, regulations for the financial sector to be more effective, uh, to provide a better oversight, and so on, and to be able to, to, to mobilize resources uh, for investments on climate mitigation and adaptation. So these are some of the areas that we can think about the public sector engagement. Then on the private sector, of course, it's very important the private sector, they need to start incorporating climate risks into their own operations. So whatever sector they are, if they are working on agriculture, they need to bring the um, climate considerations to their operations. If they work on the energy, of course, uh, low carbon um, uh, uh, low carbon consideration needs to be considered, energy efficiency and so on. So incorporating climate action and climate risk needs to be part of their uh, own operations. But also they, 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 they have a great opportunity to structure investments and opportunities. Then we go to the financial institutions like the World Bank, MDBs. I think our role is, is to help the public and private sectors to support the implementation of, of climate actions. And uh, one of the areas, of course, is provide credit enhancement. So for example, help uh, building, um, uh, enhancing credit, think about blending finance, think about uh, concessional finance uh, and so on. Let me go a little bit deeper in, in, into these aspects. Um, for example, um, at the World Bank and the engagement we have in, the, in South Asia region and, and India, of course, we have a, a suite of instruments that we can be used for and are being used already for climate mitigation. We have uh, concessional finance, we have uh, loan guarantees, uh, we, we can help to work on insurance schemes, 
uh, including, for example, agricultural insurance. This is something that we have done in other countries to help to build resilience. Uh, we can help also to reduce the risk of uh, for private to, for private investors. So, so then that's where we provide uh, country uh, country risk guarantees uh, through, through through MIGA. Uh, we can also provide um, the World Bank has the, the private sector arm, the IFC, who can provide uh, equity, uh, for example. Uh, uh, who, which can be subordinated, so then it can be higher risk, uh, able to, to take some, some higher risk. So there, there's a lot of tools that we can provide, and we're happy to work on that, and we're, we're working on, already on that with, with the government of India. But of course, we should be able to take that on scale. I think that the last point I want to make is also, it's very important to think about prioritizing, because uh, to reach a 1.5 degree trajectory, a lot has to be done and for a country like India, the, the, the effort is immense. You know, we're talking about 1.4 billion people, uh, one of the largest economies of the world. So, so there's there's some things that need to be, they're probably more urgent, and there are some things that we can do at the later stage. Yeah. So of course, um, all the growth policies, macroeconomic stability, human capital and social protection, institutional strengthening, all of these are low-hanging fruits need to be done. Uh, always um, as, as we go as a priority in the current decades. When we look specific about technologies, um, for example, investing in renewable energy, since this is already a cost efficient and investing in energy storage, th those are probably some of the low hungry fruits. It makes sense to do it now. Uh, think about again about uh, repurposing subsidies. This is something that that uh, needs to be start discussing now. You know, whenever uh, the political environment is ready for for that discussion. A lot about modal shift and efficiency in transport. You know, think about uh, you know um, bus rapid systems in, in 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 small cities, in medium cities. There's a lot that that you can do to move people out from vehicles into public transit. Energy efficiency has been mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of uh, benefits beyond. Pa pa Pablo, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I'll have to request you to uh, wind down. Okay. Wind okay. Up. So, so, so summarizing, I think that there's a there's a number of synergies that we can do, uh, and those where we see synergies that can be done in the, in the in the shorter term. But then there will also be some trade offs. So there will be more expensive technologies. That depending on on the on the cost that you have in India, those may be need, needed and in, in the future. So again, it's very important uh, given the limited amount of financing that may be available at the moment. Think about the more urgent where you see the synergies, and then where you see trade-offs and they are more expensive and less urgent uh, um, and technologies uh, that probably needs to be faced uh, for a little bit in the future, say after 2030. So these are some of my key messages and thanks and my apologies, my camera was not, not working properly. Today. And it doesn't matter. At, at least yeah. your audio was very good. So we could hear <laughs> okay, you very thanks, clearly. Thanks. I mean, that, thank you very me. much. Let me uh, segue to Dr. Malti Goel, who's been a, who's a scientist uh, and she's just retired from the government and running the Center for Science. Dr. Goel, my specific question to you is um, I hope you have heard Montek, including seen his presentation. I don't know whether you've been able to see his report or at least the summary of the report we sent you. How important will technological development be in achieving a energy transition for climate change mitigation? It sounds like a no brainer, but I still thought we could, you know, uh, uh, pick your brains on this. Yeah. Good afternoon, first of all. About seven I... minutes. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel delighted to be participating in the CUTS <laughs> seminar. Thank you, uh, Shri Mehta ji. Uh, well, I heard a lot about CUTS and especially when I was looking for the information about South-South cooperation for my book on science diplomacy. So I just wanted to say that CUTS covers a wide, wide, wide range of topics that anyone can think of. And uh, I welcome all the participants about the webinar on managing climate change a strategy for India. I congratulate uh, Shri Montekji for a study paper of a comprehensive strategy, strategy for climate change management, which he has also presented briefly uh, in the webinar. Uh, well, to begin with, uh, the response to the question, as you know, and strategy has to have minimum three uh, components covered which is policy, technology, and finances. 
So the technology, I mean, perhaps in that order. And the study has extensively analyzed the policy and financial investment needs. That's what I feel. And when it comes to technology, then we think of energy, basically. So the, uh, to answer a question, being a dominant contributor of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, the energy transitions are not are going to be the key to climate change mitigation. And the options are many, which are being many, many are being discussed for reducing the CO2 emissions from the energy producing sectors and energy demand sectors, which means several things. You would agree already that RE is a source considered very important. And India is in the forefront, having added more than 150 gigawatts in the total uh, generation capacity of 400 gigawatts. And India has set a mega target of 500 gigawatts of renewable energy in 2000 to the 30. So technology development and the materials availability, both are going to be very critical for achieving the targets. That is in response to your question, how important it is. At the same time, the question of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which has been fluctuating, uh, I mean, already this has been told that it has been around 200 to 300 parts per million over past uh, almost 800,000 years. And then six, 1950s onwards, the concentration started growing and has increased from 310 ppm to the nine, in 1970s to 421 ppm, more than 100 ppm in 2021. And China, India, US, and EU added around 70% of this in last 50 years. So the option before, therefore, has to be capture and bury carbon dioxide, which is already emitted in the atmosphere, below the ground or above the ground. Uh, CCS has been talked about. Well, uh, at present, nature-based solutions are still being preferred for this because for sequestration in forest, but capturing CO2 and value addition is attracting worldwide attention. So it is highly technology intensive proposition and technology is still developing and still carbon storage projects are only 15% of total carbon capture projects right now. So it is becoming, but it is important and it, has, it is to be uh, considered, its value has to be admitted. And the next is hydrogen, which is getting a level playing field in the energy sector now. I quote from the sixth assessment report of IPCC released in April 2022, which says, if the world is to reach net zero, hydrogen will have a vital role. So advocating both for hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, along with, of course, RE and energy efficiency, the report highlights several key challenges for hydrogen economy, which is the topic which I want to touch a little more. I recall when activities on hydrogen as a solution began almost two decades ago, uh, US announced the program on hydrogen India formed a hydrogen energy board in 2003, and the vital question since then has been what, which is the most suitable source for hydrogen, from which we are producing almost 90% of hydrogen from natural gas, and uh, what, what should be the best way? That was the key question in 2005. I clearly remember when I was in the Ministry of Science and Technology, I several times thought I uh, documented in my book on energy sources and global warming, and I thought this is a key issue. Now, the policy announcement of the government of India on National Hydrogen Mission on 15th of August by our Prime Minister Modiji and green hydrogen policy within six months of that announcement. Within six months, it's very critical, are the new milestones in the energy transition history of India. And we going to have another one minute. Sure. Thank so you. recently we had a workshop and it was pointed out that in a, uh, there are mega transitions which are taking place in the energy sector and they are technology oriented. Now, for example, use of hydrogen in demand sectors such as petro petroleum sector refineries, ammonia production for fertilizers, 
hydrogen carriers in power sector i mean these are all very very challenging and of course heavy duty vehicles and railways transport sector so these are all technology challenges and 43 countries of world have drawn their hydrogen road maps as of today india has also launched its road map on harnessing green hydrogen opportunities for deep decarbonization uh, that is by niti aayog very recently and it gives targets for achieving the uh, decarbon decarbonization of the economy by charting out near term medium term and long term policy pathways so which are considered difficult in especially in demand sectors by re alone in um, generation we can think of re as replacement to coal but in demand sector re itself cannot be so technology is challenges remain so that, i think that uh, thank you very much we we'll come back to uh, all the panelists uh, yeah. as soon as possible but before i turn to the two panelists i would like to invite utkash the co-author of the paper with montek uh, at least if you can speak about two points which montek could not cover in his presentation in view of the time limitations which you think are important for panelists to respond to i'll be delighted if you did that one point is uh, the issue which dr malti goel spoke about at length was on hydrogen for example utkash over to you you have five minutes headlines hi hi thank you mr mehta so um about hydrogen so this this lot more going on in the industry internationally and now our companies are also picking up on it the this largely the scope for blue hydrogen green hydrogen blue hydrogen that you produce from natural gas with ccs and green hydrogen that we make from ele renewable electricity and electrolyzers now there's the open debate whether you want to use natural gas to produce uh, hydrogen because long term uh, storage of carbon dioxide is still un largely unproven which leaves large uh, green hydrogen which at least at the moment is very expensive because one renewable energy is costly and second electrolyzers uh, which we would need at large scale for production of green hydrogen and millions of tons that's being talked about right now it's quite expensive um but we can say uh, hope that over the long term um while there is development research and development field the costs are expected to come down with both economies of scale and uh, cheaper methods of production and like mr alu alia pointed out during the uh, presentation that indian companies for example reliance is targeting uh, One dollar per kg cost by 2030, which is significant, and if achievable, will be uh, cost parity in, uh, in will achieve cost parity with uh, grey hydrogen, which is currently used. Grey hydrogen being uh, made from uh, coal gasification. It's a carbon intensive but an ex inexpensive process to make hydrogen. So if we have um, carbon neutral hydrogen from electrolysis process, that could decarbonize industrial processes for example uh, fertilizer production steel making where you can replace coke with uh, hydrogen to reduce iron uh, oil refining for petrochemicals and uh, yeah hydrogen is also uh, expected to solve some of the hard to abate areas in transportation for example if you turn uh, hydrogen to ammonia it can be potentially used as a marine fuel so for any for other, long distance shipping any other shipping. Utkash, Utkash, any yeah. other vital points which uh, monte could not cover because because of the time limitations uh i think towards the oh, end covered on, everything uh on finance i think um we looked at several different studies and we are we are of the view that at least for mitigation alone india would need 3% of its gdp every wow. year to cover uh, the mitigation investment costs and so now all of it 3% is a large sum and all of it we can't expect to get from uh, international sources and we think uh, from studies by mr amar bhattacharya and nicholas stern deriving from that we think that 
about half of it, we would need to mobilize it at home through additional special efforts. And the rest we can, we can push to obtain from international bilateral and multilateral sources. And the key point to that would be to using multilateral sources, the banks, the World Bank or uh, IFC thank, to leverage thank you very much financing. For, for that. that was a very substantive contribution to the discussion. Ultimately, yeah. this is what we need and this is granular. I mean, just on a little aside, C percent of GDP is the cost of a road safety scenario in the country. So I mean, I'm just, I'm just being humorous that if we save half the lives on the road, then perhaps we would have contributed much to the energy efforts itself. Uh, having said that, uh, may I now request uh, Shantanu, Shan. Thank you very much. Sorry, Sorry, Sorry I kept you waiting. Uh, That's perfectly all right. But it, now, can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, friends, uh, Shan has worked on climate change for long uh, with the with the British government in India, and now he's uh, looking after urban development uh, from the British High Commission. Now, Shan, what, what actions should be taken for? And Monte spoke about urban issues as a as a very important aspect of climate change mitigation. Uh, how would you uh, respond to what Montek said? Mm. Uh, I mean, other, than, well, other than agreeing with him, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me elaborate a little bit and uh, um, unpack a little bit some of the issues that I see. And I think basically in responding to your question, there's basically three points I would make. The, the one, the first, and I'll be brief on this one, is I think it's well understood that urbanization, when you're, you're asking the question of um, how sustainable urban growth can be done in a way which does not hinder India's economic growth. The first point is that urbanization and economic development, of course, go hand in hand. I think the virtually inextricable link between urbanization, innovation and productivity growth. And uh, I think that's quite well understood and well planned rather than chaotic and informal urbanization can greatly facilitate that process, enabling greater sust environmental sustainability uh, at the same time through creating more livable cities. So I think that's the first point I would make. And that, that certainly India is no, no exception. As, as Dr. Alawalia uh, pointed out, India's urbanization is projected, I think, to increase from about 400 million to 600 million population by 30, 2030. And, uh, to account for, 12, for about 70% of GDP, and I might add about 80% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I would very much just highlight, I think Suresh Brahma made the point, in when we talk about cities, we cannot just focus on the emissions and mitigation. Adaptation and resilience are equally mm -hmm. important when you think about heat stress, heat stress and urban flooding in particular. So that's my first point. The second point I want to make is urban development, I would say probably more than any other sector, such as energy or agriculture, perhaps, presents a lot of win-win opportunities where you can actually simultaneously improve environmental outcomes, including climate change, whilst boosting economic growth. So I don't think there's necessarily a big trade-off. And just let me give some examples of that. One is efficient and affordable rapid transit systems, especially when these are combined with higher density housing supported by land use planning. Very, very strong international evidence on the link between higher density um, urbanization supported by efficient public transport and higher incomes and productivity. It's good correlation there. I would say improved EV electric vehicles infrastructure, uh, but particularly when we think about the impacts on local air pollution, 22 of the 30 most polluted cities in the world are in India now. And there's a lot of evidence on the costs, economic costs imposed by uh, that air, poor air quality. Um, water and waste management infrastructure, I would include very much as a key area where there's a lot of approaches that can be done, new business models and technologies, which can both reduce emissions and uh, improve resilience to climate change. I think a very important area which is underplayed is urban green infrastructure, often known as nature-based solutions, often more cost-effective than hard engineered solutions and can reduce emissions and support adaptation 
for example, through cooling, um, through water, better water availability and water quality, uh, through flood mitigation. And, and this is, goes to the point about economic um, uh, growth and incomes, providing a range of ecosystem services, such as water supply um, and amenities, recreational amenities. Um, affordable green housing, I would say, is another area where there's a lot of innovation going on um, uh, to provide housing to people in a, in a way which actually reduces uh, emissions in the construction, as well as makes those houses more resilient to heat uh, uh, in particular. Faster broadband provision, I think is another intervention which has a lot of potential to both reduce, to lead to a more low carbon uh, growth path, as well as actually supporting economic opportunity. So these are some of the examples, I think, of win-win opportunities. So that's my second point. My third point is really that the key constraints are probably more to do with governance and institutional issues. So if you actually talk about the actions, they, the key underlying actions may be more actions, the first order actions may be more ones that are required to address those issues. The levels of investment by, I mean, all of these issues, as I say, they're win-win opportunities, but almost all of them require substantial upfront investment. Um, now, levels of investment by cities in India are particularly low by international standards. I think $17 per capita, per capita infrastructure capex um, compared to a suggested international benchmark of $100 per capita to build in urban infrastructure. Um, national, state and city governments really work, need to work together to address these governance and capacity constraints, develop better revenue and financing models, uh, improve the credit worthiness of cities and attract more private capital and improve the implementation of investment um, programs by cities, which is, is currently very weak. So a lot of the actions that could help address this, there are many, include things like perhaps devolution of functions, of fiscal uh, functions to subnational level, uh, particularly city governments, unleashing internal revenue sources, reducing reliance on central, more uh, provisional and, and contingent central and state fiscal transfers. Um, so, and generally building the institutional capacity of cities to absorb. So I think unless these constraints are addressed, it's gonna be difficult to actually make progress in a sustained way in implementing some of the, um, some of the actions, the technological and policy actions that would be needed. I would say that multilateral banks and other international partners can certainly help in that effort. And city networks like the C40 and ICLEI can help cities to learn from each other and spread innovation and good practice in governance and policy. So I'll end there, maybe if I have 30 seconds, um, but just, just to close, I mean, that's what I wanted to say on urban issues, but just to say, I mean, India's announcement of net zero was really a game changer, potentially a game changer. And I think, you know, it's the way that that is going to now, and we're seeing it now stimulating uh, attention to thinking about what is now needed to implement that. Uh, we've seen that in the UK, in fact, the net zero target has really been welcomed by businesses who have recognized, uh, appreciated the clarity, recognized the opportunity, and are now moving fast to deliver. So as a result, we're now seeing the low carbon economy in the UK growing much faster than the traditional economy. That's not to say that the UK has cracked everything. I think it's doing quite well on decarbonizing our energy system, phasing out coal, but a long way to go in areas like transport, buildings, agriculture. So I think we have a lot to learn from each other in many of these um, areas. So let me let me stop there and hand back. Thank to you, Sean. And you still have to elect the new prime minister. Yes. Yes, we <laughs> do. Exactly. We're waiting with bated breath. And maybe you might get an Indian prime minister. We might do. We <laughs> might. Quite <laughs> possible. Yeah, then the whole circle will turn around. <laughs> uh, having said that, may I now come to Dr. Manoj Singh Rathod, uh, coming from the grassroots, uh, particularly Dr. Rathod? Yeah, please. Thank How you very much. Uh, you see, if you, uh, if you, if you, thank uh, you. Can I, can I, I, I just I complete know your my question? question? Sorry? I know your question. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> About the policy, mobility policies to be uh, re redefined in India. That is the question, no? Right. 
okay uh, first uh, let me thank uh, aluwalia ji for producing such a wonderful uh, paper uh, covering comprehensively many things and it was uh, really needed that uh, but there are uh, and, and the emphasis is on two things one is uh, development of technology and second is electrification because most of the problem is visualizing that that uh, can be sorted out if uh, electrification is there and uh, uh, technology is evolved now uh, first question is that uh, who should produce that technology in the private sector or government sector because according to the policy change has to be there and financial arrangement has to be made that way the second co is that public private when we say immediately there is a reaction political reaction like uh, railways privatization of railways privatization of uh, city uh, transport system and uh, it is uh, i think presumed that uh, private sector is more efficient than public sector which we feel we see also what uh, it is always not true so uh, uh, how to make that balance and the policy has to be uh, framed uh, making that balance between private and public sector um, and taking care of uh, political <coughs> consensus on uh, these issues otherwise uh, nothing can happen uh, next is the urban rural issues i think uh, the policies for uh, rural areas has to be different differential policy is needed urban areas as if 50% of population comes there congestion will be there so Uh, earlier long back uh, kanta ji and myself in the institute of development studies had a study of um, uh, planned uh, city plan where uh, satellite towns were planned and uh, don't uh, expand the size of the city you know that sort of arrangement so we what we need is the um, making mass city master plans considering Uh, the long term needs of transport system which is missing we see in the jaipur also uh, city um, next is the industrial policy uh, related to transport now uh, when we say uh, industrial policy uh, the major problem and we are also depending lot on industry to develop technology and other things now we did conducted a study for pollution control board what we found that time we reviewed laws and regulations and it was unfortunate that there are large number of laws and regulations which actually blocks uh, incentive uh, for industries to innovate even a small change they have to seek clearance from uh, even which is efficient positive everything they have to take clearance from the pollution control board and it takes months and a lot of uh, corruption and other things are also there so how to uh, you know reduce that the government has to review all these laws and regulations uh, next is uh, in the our np uh, napcc document national uh, there is one <clears throat> very important thing written is our approach is a public private partnership and civil society action now there is lot of talk about public private participation but nobody is talking about the civil society how do we, which civil society we are talking about and what level and what sort of a responsibility we are going to give to the civil society Uh, so that is uh, that has to be more uh, you know discussed debated uh, next is uh, where are the people in these suggestions i find are they on the receiving end only or uh, uh, they can contribute something and if they want to contribute then uh, what role we visualize for them and uh, what we generally find is that uh, awareness building or capacity building that is the but uh, i don't see much uh, outcome of those activities at the ground level uh, also there is uh, i think uh, in the paper also it is mentioned that need for incentivizing uh, to adopt new technology uh, in many cases and um, that is very important but how to create willingness to adopt that is important and uh, i think uh, that uh, needs to be uh, further explained my major question is about the governance now we assume that whatever suggestion would, we make would you like to would you like to wind up yes uh, thank you governance uh, at the ground level we feel that whatever we give will be absorbed and can be converted and it will be efficiently implemented but our governance system is very weak 
and uh, there is a big gap between what policy maker thinks at the national level and the state level and the implementation uh, implementers. Uh, also, there is no capacity of the state, no or, or very less capacity of the state to prepare good policies. There are large number of policies, there is no convergence between them. They are contradictory also. So how to make uh, policies which are in line with what national government is thinking and what state government is doing. State plays a very significant role. And if there is a uh, different political party is there, then uh, many of the programs can be uh, what we are seeing that it is not being implemented. So it's the governance issue has also, also to be very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I, you know, Dr. Rathod, you raised some very valid points, and this is something which uh, uh, Montague had also pointed out in his opening remarks. Now, you know, just coming to a point which you made and what Shantanu was making was, uh, Shant Shant, the problem is that Article 74 of the Constitution of India, now, which is a constitutional provision, has not been implemented honestly by states. They still do not devolve power to the local levels. With the result that many of these things that we are talking about remain in the air and you leave it to the state governments to do, which may not often happen. And this is one of the reasons why uh, Montague has suggested uh, that we need to build up a political consensus on many of these issues that if in the event that we would like the humanity to survive, uh, maybe 50 years later or 100 years later, the way things are going on. Uh, Frankly, uh, can I request, Montek, would you like to come in for five minutes here? Before I go back to the panelists for their uh, remarks. And by the way, uh, there are, uh, the, the chat box has a few questions. And anybody who wants to raise a question can do it in the chat box. Montek, there is a question to you, which you could, you know, begin with asking about. Talking about adaptation aspects of climate change, and adaptation is something which Shantanu pointed out as something very important. We've been talking about mitigation alone. Should we not take a look at, relook at the local Agenda 21 as adopted in Rio in 1992? Uh, status, progress, particularly access and benefit sharing mechanisms involving local communities managing common resources. Over to you, Monty. Yeah, the, <clears throat> thank you very much, Pradeep. Uh, very interesting discussion. And in fact, it's been so wide ranging that there's no way that I can pull together all these strands. I mean, to some extent, the purpose of my paper was to point out that on the one hand, we have made some very ambitious, laid down some very ambitious targets. There's no question about that. And I'm glad that we've laid them down. And the fact that we gave a date for net zero was widely regarded internationally as a very important breakthrough. Uh, other country, other major countries have also laid down targets and that's a big change. The, the real problem and what comes out in my paper is that if you were to ask yourself, what do you need to do? It's not gonna be the result of one or two interventions. There are no magic bullets here. Then I have concentrated on laying out a lot of the detail. And one of the problems is that everybody agrees with the slogan. I and mean, for example, there is nobody who says we should not combat climate change. Okay, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's, it's a universal slogan. What I don't find an agreement on is therefore we must do A, B, C, and D. Clearly one issue, which is very relevant, is uh, we know that the COP26 is not adequate. I mean, the promises are not adequate. Everybody will have to tighten uh, their commitments. In all probability, the developing country, developed countries will say that, you know, we are going down to net zero by 2050. You fellows should also go down to net zero by 2050 and things would be okay. But the truth is that that would be a highly inequitable thing because what is currently uh, on the table from the uh, developed countries is a pattern of emissions which would take up almost the entire carbon budget and which remains. So even if you forget about historical inequities, the fact is that developing countries are 
developed countries should do much better than what they've promised. That's the first point. And I think we in the developing world should also recognize that we also have to do much better. But you know, how much better is going to vary a lot by country. Uh, the US will have to do a lot better. China will have to do a huge amount better. Russia will have to do a lot better. Europe will have to do a lot better, but not as much as these other countries. So this is one issue that will this be resolved in COP27? I have no idea. I've not touched on it, but I flagged it. That's an issue. Second issue that I've, I didn't go into is the whole financing issue. And I think Utkarsh brought it out very well. There's no question that all this is going to require a hell of a lot more money. There's no question that the 100 billion that has been talked about is irrelevant. That was decided in 2009 when what was being demanded was very little. Somehow that 100 billion was totally arbitrary and it has just continued. And the debate is on why have we not reached 100 billion? I mean, it's pretty regrettable that we haven't even reached 100 billion. But it's not as if if you reach 100 billion, you will have done very much to achieve what is the objective laid out now in COP26. And that would require much more. Is the world community willing to do this? I don't know. I think your representative from the World Bank said, you know, we can do this and we can do that. And I think that's all good. I have no doubt that the multilateral institutions will do a little more. The question is, is their response going to be commensurate with the need? And on that one, quite frankly, it won't be. Uh, it's a huge challenge for the world community and Nick Stern and Amar Bhattacharya and many others have been pointing out that we need a political level commitment. Now, you know, Janet Lev Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, said the right thing. She said the, the need is for trillions and we're talking about billions. So it's not as if uh, sensible people out there aren't aware of it, but you know, that has to be translated into international agreements. I, I mean, the next major international event, of course, will be COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. That's not an occasion where financial things are discussed. The G20 is such an occasion. The Indonesian presidency will be having the G20 in November. You know, given the present uh, tensions between the US and Russia, uh, whether they will be much achieved in this G20 is an open question. Uh, so in a way, the next chairmanship will be India. Uh, can we somehow, hopefully by then, the objective circumstances also might have changed a little? Can we do something? These are open questions to which I don't have an answer, but they're very important questions. Thank you. My, Thank concern, you. my concern really was that I've raised a number of uh, what you would call controversial issues on which the participants do, have not actually agreed. And for example, I said, I have no doubt we should privatize some, not all, but some of the distribution companies. Well, somebody said, well, you know, but it's not clear that this public sector is worse than private sector. What do we want to do on, uh, on re getting rid of subsidies? What do we want to do about the underpricing of electricity? What are we going to do on carbon taxation? Now, if we knock out all of these things on the grounds that they're difficult, then you can be sure that we will achieve nothing. The trouble is, even if you do something, the problem will be, are we doing enough? But in my view, I think the important thing right now is, let's get an agreement on what we need to do. For example, somebody talks about sharing technologies. What does that mean? Look, technologies can be bought. Are we saying that somebody should give us these technologies free? Are we saying they should give it free to anybody who asks for it? I mean, are we serious about that? Personally, I don't think that, you know, if, if a technology is available in the market, you've got the technology if you want to buy it. And quite honestly, for many of these technologies, even if you got the technology free, it's not as if you could produce the equipment needed, which embodies that technology. I mean, after all, uh, only a few countries would actually be able to do that. So I think we need much greater clarity on what we, what we expect. 
uh, there was some talk, for example, uh, on government, should government fund research or private sector? Now, you know, if you want to break through in green hydrogen, I would put my bet on Reliance and Mr. Adani much more than on any government laboratory. But if you really want to break through in agricultural research, it has to be done by the government. Even there, we need to do it in cooperation with seed producing companies, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to self-critically examine a lot of our postures to ask what is the difficult issue here and how do we intend to tackle it? I think there's one question you raised about local empowerment and so on. You know, yes, the 74th Amendment was never implemented by state governments in the spirit in which it was intended. And personally, I think in certain areas like health, education, etc., more of that would have been a better idea. But you know, one of the critical things there is that who's going to do the recruitment? Are you are you devolving the recruitment of teachers to the local level? Or are you simply saying the state government will recruit the teachers and you run the schools with state government teachers? That will have no effect whatsoever. So even those who argue for devolution are not very clear how much devolution do they really want or mean. It's a tough question, and I'm not surprised, by the way. And let me put it this way. We're talking about a transition over the next 30, 40 years. So don't think we can solve it in a one day or a half an hour discussion. But I think we, we need to zero in on the difficult issues and try and build a consensus on that. Because if we leave it to the general level, everybody will be agreed. And what you'll get is a somewhat vacuous, uh, which is what happens, frankly, in most international discussions. I mean, I'm not a great admirer of the, 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 the Millennium Development Goals because the Millennium Development Goals is a listing of all kinds of good things and everything, everyone who had an idea is there. It doesn't zero in on anything that's really difficult. Thanks, Monte. Thank you. Monte, would you, would you like to write an article enumerating all these steps and not necessarily all the steps but at least the critical steps well i have I mean, this, this paper that i uh, displayed if you look at the conclusions there are three pages of con two and a half pages okay now it would be very interesting if you want to do a workshop i mean if you want to do a kind of a little chatbot or whatever it is hmm. just reproduce the conclusions and at okay. the bottom ask people to comment do they just ask them do they agree do they disagree or do they want this phrased in a different way i would be fascinated in that kind of feedback we'll do. so one can we'll imagine do. you know the, yeah. all the things will agree don't yeah, agree we are, we are now coming to an end of our event shantanu there is shan there is one question to you uh in the chat box i don't know if you've seen it no no i haven't let me see what, what, what is oh, the question? this was shan can we think of green Sorry. municipal bonds to address these challenges Oh, including turning them into opportunities. Yeah, you know, let me put it this way. Uh, uh, I, I mean, the, there's some assumption that if you've got a green bond, if you call something a green bond, somehow you'll get money. The truth is there are certain investors who prefer to put their money into green bonds rather than into other bonds. And some credible certification has to be there that this is indeed a green bond. Uh, but the, a bondholder expects to be repaid. So the question is, uh, who's doing who's doing the borrowing? Government of India raising a green bond just means that the government of India is borrowing. And it's on the strength of the government of India that you're putting your money in. But I mean, for example, if a, if a distribution company were to issue a green bond, saying that we are now going in for a lot of purchase of renewable electricity, so we, in order to manage this renewable electricity, we have to do a lot of improvement in our distribution system and financing that by a green bond. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, we're making huge losses and we're broke. I don't think you'll get a rupee. Yeah. So frankly, I think there's a lot of uh, mispresentation of the role of green bond. It is true, by the way, that there are many people uh, 
I mean, some of our major corporations, the Tatas, the Reliance, Adani, others, whose financial strength is not in doubt. If they were to issue green bonds, I can well imagine that many people would say, let's buy these green bonds because I have a feeling that I'm helping something which is otherwise viable. But at the back of their mind, there will be the concern, are these bonds going to get repaid? And if that's a problem, they're not going to get repaid. And municipalities are not financially viable. That's the problem. No, not, but most of these bonds have a sovereign guarantee and therefore they do attract subscription for whatever yeah, it is. You don't need a, what is a, for a sovereign guarantee, you'd get the subscription anyway. There are any number of yeah, people willing. Right. So what, it's not additional. I mean, look, if, if if India has a limit on how many how much sovereign borrowing it can do, all that the green bond is doing is shifting the borrowing it does into certain areas. It's not an additional resource at all. That is what Monty, That is what they did for discom debts just now. This government what? issued bonds for the discom debts. Well, I don't know. I don't know which com uh, who has said that or what they mean. I, I beg your pardon. That was petroleum. Uh, Shantanu? Well, I have not much to add to that. Just, I mean, I very much agree. Firstly, that it's one of the key issues then is making sure the underlying assets investments are genuinely green rather than greenwashing. And secondly, it is the credit worthiness. And I, I think that um, a couple of issues, a couple of uh, possible ways around this. One is an individual city or municipal municipality. The scale of, of the investments and the green bond issues may not be large enough to really attract attention, say, on, say if you look at the city of London, where there are people, pension funds are looking for these kind of opportunities. So can we find ways to pool together municipalities um, to spread the risk and, and, and bring together a larger overall bond issuance? And the issue about the additionality of guarantees, I mean, it is an area, even if it's a zero sum game when it comes to sovereign government, only sovereign guarantees that international players uh, could think about that being part of what they do to buy credit enhancement and help uh, attract more climate finance to India. So can players like the World Bank or even the government of the UK and others who may have opportunities for sovereign guarantees um, look into this. And I think uh, that's something that we'd certainly be interested in exploring. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have now come to an, uh, an end of our event, but should the panelists, Dr. Goel, Benit, Pablo, Manor Singhji, have any last minute comments for 30 seconds? 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. I want to make a comment. Please, please. Okay. Now that uh, we are concluding, I would like to mention three uh, three points for uh, review. I mean, for Ten seconds each. <laughs> revisiting. <laughs> like, you see, <laughs> when we talk of, uh, first of all, uh, carbon markets, government policies, why the carbon markets have not come to picked up in India? That is one thing which needs to be revisited. Very good. And what we need to do to create a strategy for corporate sector. Like we have a policy, government policy, we have um, technology, we have investment. Of course, we talk of investment, both private and public. But what about the corporate strategy? Who decides that? Fine. So and that the, third, the third point? This is one point. The other oh, that was, I thought that was the second point. OK. Uh, <laughs> then the uh, other one is about dealing with the technology, basically, because I'm a scientist. So I would like to say, first of all, what is green hydrogen? We should decide on that. We should not just go for just one uh, aspect of water and electrolyzer. We should think what is green hydrogen. And second point is uh, that linking technology with ecology. Because what is happening is that uh, uh, we make some decisions about technology. For, for example, we made decision about the uh, this, uh, plants and then we decided that it is water consuming, we stop it. Similarly, for example, we have waste to energy, then what kind of pollution it causes? So should we go yeah. for the revisit waste to energy or waste to hydrogen? I mean, this is what, as a scientist, I would like to comment. Thank you so very much. Uh, Thank you. Pablo Manor Singhji. Um, yeah, no, no, I think the discussions have been extremely useful. 
I just want to emphasize again the, the, the first, the, to continue the dialogue with the private sector. I think when we talk about the scale of financing, uh, private sector is going to be the majority of the financing uh, for climate. And second, always think together about climate and nature financing. It's not just to think only about climate change, mitigation, adaptation, but also we have the nature problem. You know, there's land degradation, deforestation uh, globally, you know, in general. So let's try to put these two agendas together on financing, bo both um, climate and also nature financing. Thank and you. again, we're happy to, to, to continue the discussions after. Thanks. Thank you very much. Manu Singhi? Well, Manu Singhi, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm there. Uh, I fully agree with Montegi that uh, we should uh, pin down that which are the issues where we agree and how to sort it out. Yeah, that is the Thank best. you. Thank you very much. That is excellent. And with that, I would like to thank everybody, and particularly Montek and his uh, co author. Uh, Utkarsh for this uh, wonderful paper and uh, we'll take up the challenge of looking at the, the last two and a half pages of the report and to see as to how we can generate a better debate on that and particularly involve the private sector also. And tomorrow I'm speaking to a, a bunch of private sector uh, leaders and I will certainly raise this issue with them and see as to whether there is an appetite for them to discuss these issues. Unfortunately, what I do see Generally speaking, among even the educated uh, friends that I have, that other than the fact is that it was very hot summer, they don't feel the need for discussing climate change. <laughs> ah, it is related to climate change. Now, what I was reading yesterday was in Spain, the highest temperature has gone up to 46 degrees, which is, which is phenomenal. I mean, so overall, there is a, <coughs> a continuous reminder to all of us that, look, we have stopped we have to you know uh, ensure that uh, we do uh, we reduce our consumption improve our responsibilities in order to see to it that climate change adverse impacts do not take place uh, with that uh, let me thank you all once again and particularly uh for his excellent presentation and we'll come back to this uh, issue as montague has asked us to do thank you very much Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Pradeep. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye.